Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As people of faith, we're called to demonstrate that faith by trusting God. And where is it the best to trust God? And what I mean by that is, when is that trust going to be most noticeable? When is people going to see your faith? The answer is, when you are in a very trying, difficult, hard situation. And how one holds up to that, what he says, how he testifies with his words, how he testifies with his actions, speak loudest in those difficult, hard times. The children of Israel are not willing to demonstrate trust. And the conclusion for that is very simple. They do not have faith. They are not walking in a covenantal agreement. They are the covenant people, but they are not living with that commitment. And one of the things that we need to constantly ask ourselves is that same question. Are we? Are we demonstrating trust in God? When we find ourselves in hard, trying circumstances, do we say to ourselves, this is a spiritual opportunity. Here is when I can demonstrate faith. Here is when I can bear witness, show testimony that I belong to God, that my faith is that God will move in that circumstance. He will help me in these troubles, and I will experience God's faithfulness that delivers me, that causes me to be an overcomer. Is that how you and I actually respond in the midst of hard times. Well, Israel wasn't interested in being a faithful witness. They weren't interested in demonstrating trust. What were they doing? Well, to answer that question, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 30. Now, it begins in a way that we have encountered previously with this Hebrew word hoy, which speaks about a very dismal future. It speaks about how awful something's going to be. Now, usually there is a hope, there's an encouragement, there's a call to change in order that that dismal future won't be a reality. But here we don't see much evidence that Israel, God's covenant people, are going to change. That they're going to, to repent. That they're going to embrace the truth of God. And something else that's interesting is how God addresses them. Now, there's no way to really express this properly in English unless we know the word, and how it's used in the scripture. Because he says, hoy, how awful it's going to be. Some Bibles will translate it simply, woe, meaning how awful and a call to stop, a call to repent. But he says, benim sorerim. And the term ben sorer appears in the book of Deuteronomy, about a young man whom his parents, they have taught him, they have educated him in the things of God, they have disciplined him when he's gone astray, and nothing causes this young man to behave properly. He is a great menace to society. He's a danger, he's a threat, and at a last resort, and it's his parents that initiate this, 
according to Deuteronomy. They bring him before the elders of the city. And the city itself comes out for this judgment. And the parents testify, this is our son. We have trained him. We have educated him. We have disciplined him. But he he rebels against this discipline. He is not willing to hear our words of instruction. And because of this testimony that he's been disciplined, that he's been educated in the things of God, and he utterly rejects them, he is rebellious through and through and cannot be controlled. Therefore, a death sentence is placed upon him and carried out at the gates of the city. So what God is saying is this. He is saying, how awful it's going to be. I see you as these rebellious sons that are going to experience judgment, a consuming judgment of God. This is how this this chapter opens up. So, woe, O rebellious. And again, very strong word for being rebellious and totally unwilling to change and do what you know is right. And then we read, declares the Lord. And it speaks about them. To do, and this is the word, etzah, which is a counsel, but it also can be understood as a plan. It is what you have, have rendered to be your course of action. So they have a course of action, what they want to do. But he says, lo mimi, many, which means not from me. And then we have to cover up. Now they're guilty, but they want to cover it up, meaning pour upon it and its expression for throwing water on a situation. It's the same word for making a libation offering. It's a play on words. So they're trying to throw water on the situation saying, it's not this is bad. It's not this great a problem. They want to cover it up. And he says, but but not with my spirit. They do this covering up. They state the words that they state in order that They can add sin unto sin. This is what motivates them to be sinful. They are not interested in the righteousness of God. And this is something that every believer to really check. Have I believed a biblical gospel? Am I truly a disciple of Messiah Yeshua? Am I a servant of God? Well, to answer affirmative to all those questions, you must be interested in the righteousness of God. If you set aside the righteousness of God for your plans, or if you believe that that your destiny is exactly what you want things to, to turn out to be, then you are no different in this situation than the children of Israel. Look now to verse 2. They know that judgment is coming. And therefore, they say, the ones who go down to Egypt, and it says, and my mouth, they did not ask. They're not seeking deliverance. They're not seeking my presence in this situation. All they want to do is flee to Egypt. And we know something. Both Isaiah, Jeremiah speak about how wrong it is to trust in Egypt. Now, I shared with you many times that there is a relationship biblically between the concept of Egypt and the world. So what this is saying is they trust in worldly means, worldly provision, rather than the promises of God. They're not committed to the purposes of God. God has a plan with these people. 
And because he has a plan with these people, he will deliver them. He will move. He will help. He will assist. And he will act against the enemy. But because they are not aware of God's plans, they have rejected them. They're not committed to them. They're not interested in speaking and hearing revelation from God. And that's why it says, and my mouth, they did not ask for power. But in the refuge of Pharaoh, they have taken cover. They, they trust in the shadow of Egypt. So it's a play on words because oftentimes this word for, for shadow represents the presence of God. They don't want to be in the presence of God. And this shows that they have no trust. They do not walk in faith. They're not interested in what God can do. They want to take care of the matter themselves their way. Verse, verse 3. And it shall come about to them the, the refuge of Pharaoh for shame. And the refuge, another word, just a different Hebrew word, but for the same idea of, of taking cover in the shadow of Egypt will be for, and it's a synonym for shame. So we have two different words that, that shows in the end, instead of having a pleasing testimony, instead of having that which is, is trustworthy, they're not being trustworthy. They're not trusting in God. Rather, they're trusting in man. They're trusting in Egypt. In other words, they're trusting in the world. Verse 4. For they were in so on, so on their, their cabinet officials. And this is a word for the leading government officials. They left Jerusalem. They left the land, and they went to a very well-known place in Egypt. Likewise, their, their messengers, those that were supposed to take the truth to the people, encourage them. What did they do? They're found in a place called Hanes. This is where they arrived, these messengers. And according to Jewish tradition, this was a royal city. This was a city of, of great wealth. That's where they went. They chose financial security, which is really deception, rather than trusting that God delivers his faithful stewards, those who speak and do what God tells them to do. So through and through, these people demonstrate a lack of trust, no faith. They are rebellious in the things and the purposes of God. Verse 5, all, and this word is a word that speaks about something that is a stench. So it's literally in the Hebrew, hifil, which is to cause a stench. So all, all that cause a stench upon the people. These, these ones, it is not a benefit to them. So what they're doing, it's no benefit, but rather it shows the, the spiritual decay of the leadership that's being visited upon the people. It does not help. It is not profitable for shame and disgrace is what they're going to experience. Now, what are the things that really needs to be pointed out is how the Bible goes to one or two extremes. You are either going to have shame, you are either going to be a stench before God, or you are going to be someone that is rewarded, someone that experiences the goodness of God, and you are going to be a sweet, fragrant aroma before God. 
It's an either or. Don't run to the middle. The middle is not a safe ground. God is never found in the middle. He is found in truth. He is found in the center of his will. And when we turn to the right or to the left, we're bringing that stench, we're bringing that shame, that defeat upon ourselves. Verse 6. A burden of the animals of the Negev, the south. Obviously, Egypt is in the south. And so we're going to see that there is a message to these animals. In the land of trouble and distress. And it speaks about two different words for a lion and also two different types of snakes. A regular snake, one whose bite is very, very uh, uh, harmful, one that's very, very much an instrument of suffering, and another one that speaks almost as a jumping It's literally a flying, but most understand it as a jumping snake that brings about great fear because he he appears suddenly out of nowhere. And we find that they are going to place upon the backs of their, their donkeys, and this is a word for camels as well, their their wealth, their resources. And upon now the backs of camels on the humps. Of camels they're going to put their treasuries but upon the people this will not be of benefit they will not benefit from this so in the midst of this fleeing from the promised land and the fact that they flee from the promised land shows that they really don't seek the promises of God this is not what they're committed to And this is something that the land of Israel represents. Those who believe in the promises that God made to Israel, they're going to want, if they're part of Israel, they're going to be committed to being in the land. And we see today that there's a renewed emphasis in the land. And this speaks about God who's going to move, and he's going to move mightily in order to bring about a change in the thinking of the people of Israel, the Jewish people at large, in order that through this change, they are going to become recipients of the promise of God. Verse verse 7. And Egypt, Egypt, and it's the word hevel, which is vanity, It speaks about a vapor that that dissipates quickly, that there's nothing to it. So Egypt is in vain and empty that, that they will help. Their help is vain and empty. Therefore, I have called to this, and this one means Egypt. And what does he say? He calls to Egypt Rahav, which is a term for pride, and they are Shabbat, which is idol. So what he's saying is, you turn to Egypt for help, and they only think about themselves, and they are going to be idle. They are not going to respond to, to you. And no matter what they have said, no matter what type of agreement that you've entered into it, this word is a word for canceling out in its, its meaning. So all the hope that that the people have placed in Egypt to be a deliverance, they're not going to do it. They're selfish-minded and all their promises are empty, vain, and will come to nothing. They just simply act as if they have been canceled out. Verse verse 8. And now... I I call, come, excuse me, verse 8, and now come and write upon the tablet. And God is saying, write upon the tablet with them, meaning before them, in their presence, and upon the book, a statue, 
meaning legislate this publicly. Put this into being a law. And what is this? It is for the last day until eternity. And all of this is language that is emphasizing what God is saying in this chapter. You can write it down. You can engrave it in a tablet. You can make it an eternal law because what he's saying is going to be. We're going to see, in other words, and some of the sages interpret this, that we can see what's happening here at this time and learn from it what's going to happen in the last days, that this has kingdom implications. So it's for the last day. Is literally what it says. Look again at verse 8, where it says, The latter day. Unto ad olam. Unto forever or eternity. Verse 9. For a people of rebellion is the sons, meaning the sons of Israel. They are children of falsehood, children or sons that do not want to hear the law of the Lord. Now, I think this is so significant because the law of the Lord, when we hear that, you know what should come into our mind? Righteousness. They don't want to hear what is righteous. They're not interested in the purposes of God. They are not motivated by what is pleasing to God. And what this is telling us is that this is going to be the spiritual condition of Israel in the last days. But we're going to see next week, as we continue in this chapter, that God's going to be faithful. He is going to bring a change among this people. Why? Because he has a plan. His purposes eventually are going to be fulfilled, and he will cause a change, a drastic change, a glorious change, a pleasing change among the people of Israel before him. This is what we can expect. In this current condition and leading up to the last days, we see here that they are a rebellious people, a lying people, a people that do not want, and this is a strong word for want, they really don't want to hear the law of the Lord. Verse 10. Who, which they say to the the seers, these are ones who see visions, and what do they say? Do not look. And to another group that sees visions, It says, do not uh, have visions for us. Then they have a word for nechokot. And this is a word according to the sages that means basically everything will be okay. In other words, we don't need revelation from God. So they tell the prophets, the seers, those who have visions, "We, we, we don't need you to look For any revelation, everything will be okay. There's no reason to be concerned. Speak to us. What's that? Flattery. Speak to words that are pleasing, that are smooth, meaning that they're in agreement with our desire. And have visions which are, and it's a concept that relates to a misplaced hope a misplaced desire. They have a desire for something which they want these, we could say, false prophets, these seers, these who have visions. They want falsehood. They're not interested in the truth. They want what they want, and their prophets, their seers, their leaders are going to be the ones who tell them what they want to hear. And when we look at the New Covenant, teachings from Paul and Peter, And from John, we see that in the last days, this is also going to to describe a group that are within the body of believers. 
Now, they're not believers. The scripture says that they're going to go out from us because they were never part of us. This departure and this apostasy that they're going to be supporting and be the source of, along with their leader, the Antichrist, all of this is going to bear witness that they were not believers. So we see a parallel here, verse 11. Then they say, turn, and it basically means get out of the way. Now, the people are turning to godly leaders. They're turning to Isaiah. They're turning to those who are faithful in their midst. And they say, look at verse 11, turn from the way, and the implication is the right way, and then they say a different word, but means more or less the same thing, turn from the way. But it's a different word for way. The first time when we look at verse 11, it's a word derech, which is a road, a way. And then we have the word orach, which is another word for a pathway, a, a road for traveling. And then they tell the people, or the people tell the, people tell the leadership, cease from before us the Holy One of Israel. They don't want, and notice this, they didn't say God. They said the Holy One of Israel. Meaning simply, remember how I share so frequently that the word holy is related to the purpose of God. And they don't want the purposes of God. They don't want holiness. They don't want righteousness. They want nothing connected to the plans, the purposes, the objectives of God. Why? They're all about what they want. Verse 12. Therefore said the Lord, th therefore thus said the Holy One of Israel, because you, and this is a word for having a strong uh, feeling of rejection, a disdain, a total, total, uh, it's a word that speaks about how the, the stone of the, the, the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone, but this word means to be fed up with something. We can't overestimate how it means something that is utterly among the people rejected. So he says, therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you have rejected this word and you have trusted in oppression and perversity, that you, that, that, that you think that uh, uh, will, save, will save him, meaning save the people. You've trusted in the wrong things. You, you think the wrong one is going to, to, to save you. Therefore, therefore, it will be to you this iniquity as a breach that bursts forth, that falls upon you, as a bulge in the wall, up high, which suddenly, now, up high means you don't see it, but it's going to burst suddenly, this, this bulge in the wall, and wall relates to security. It's going to budge, burst suddenly and quickly, and there will come great breaking. And it's another word for destruction. Verse 14. And the breaking will be as the breaking of, of a that which the, the potter has created. And it will be broken into pieces. There will not be any uh, lessening. There will not be any uh, movement of God when he brings his judgment of, of regret or mercy or pity. It will not be found it will not be found among the pieces, a, a pottery shear, in order to take, to take the, the fire from the, the stove or to remove the water from the cistern. Now, water and fire 
can relate to judgment. And what it's saying here is judgment is coming and there's nothing that's going to stop this judgment. There's not going to be anything among the people that they can have in order to, if you have uh, something that's burning in this stove, there's, you take a piece of pottery and you scrape it out. Or something that you can remove water from the cistern. They have no provision in order to, to lessen the judgment that is coming upon them. That's what God is saying in this passage of Scripture. Look now to, to the last part of verse 15 or, or verse 15. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, when he returns and he, and it's a word here for joy, it could relate to comfort. And notice the abrupt change. No sooner does God say one thing that he's speaking now about what he's going to do. He says, when return and comforts and, and save in quietness and in trusting, this will be your power. But there's a problem. They did not want. It's a same example of them not wanting what God is able and what he is going to do. Now, again, all of this foreshadows a change, a change that he's going to bring upon the people in the last days. And we'll see this next week. Verse 16. And you will say, no, we, we don't want your deliverance, which you're offering. We don't want to rely upon you for anything, but rather upon quick horses, we will sit. And he says here, on quick horses, you want to flee. Therefore, you will flee upon these quick horses. So here's here, now the word for sitting. But therefore, they, meaning the one who pursues you, your pursuers, they're going to be on swift horses, and the implication is quicker horses. And last verse, verse 17, and one from among them will cause a thousand to flee because of the terror that this one's going to bring. And from before the fear, the terror of five shall flee all the ones who remain. And it will be at the end like a, a mask of a, a flag, a flagpole without a flag, empty. Nothing there to, to show uh, a nation as though the nation did not exist. So it says, as a, a flagpole upon the top of a mountain, as a pole, and this is another pole, that speaks about a defeated enemy. It says, upon a hill. And what it's saying simply is this, that Israel, and I'm speaking this among the people of God in a general sense, they're not going to be seen for a moment, any remnant even, that the situation is going to look dreadful for the people. This is what we need to remember, a, a message of hopelessness. God says, I'm able to do it. I'm willing to do it. I want to save you. I'm going to save you. And the people say, no, thank you. We'll deliver ourselves our way. We'll take things into our own hands. We'll do it our way. And they believe foolishly that their way is the best way. Realize this. Your way is never the best way. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. 
Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.